to help mm. uh, much of the time, you know, and that's great. I mean, yeah. competitive sports are all about suffering. When you think about it, there's a good, to, to know that there's a good result that comes from it. But do, you, yeah, but do you think in the West here, we've been mentally prepared to deal with suffering in a post-Christian world? Um, I feel we're ill-equipped compared to the past. I don't know whether I... Th well, I think there is a component of, of being a, of a religious mindset that yeah. helps us understand that even if there is suffering, there is a light at the end of the tunnel and maybe we can actually help grow ourselves through the, just not necessarily suffering but our understanding and having the parameters around us to know when we're being when we need to not do bad things. So many of the problems we have today are because we we know what's bad and we do those things anyway. Yeah. We drink, we smoke, we, we have reckless lifestyles. Yeah, yeah. Christians, not so much. I don't think we see that too, many, too much in Christian society. And I don't think we see it at all in, in the Muslim world particularly. You know? Less so. There's a strong sense of what's right, family values, and yeah. they are inherent. Yeah. Don't mess with them. You know? it's, yeah. it's great to see yeah. very wise people here. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, when you spoke about meaning or light, you know, you have this light at the end. The problem is, if we, if we look at it from a liberal perspective, and we live obviously in liberal societies, we're not taught these things. We're not taught the idea that suffering may have a meaning. If you come from a worldview which is essentially materialistic, then there is no meaning behind the suffering. There are no values. There is no intrinsic morals. And Today, people are a lot less tenacious than they were in the past. Like, say, say something like the Holocaust. We had people like Victor Stengel, uh, who, Victor Frankl, sorry, who wrote the book um, Man's Search of Meaning. Uh, yeah, and, way, yeah. and one of the things that he says is that, you know, he was uh, in the Holocaust and he was in the uh, concentration camps. And one of the things that he said is that the people who believed in meaning were able to deal with the pain. Very much, yeah. But the people who did not believe in meaning, it was incredibly difficult for them to deal with the pain. And if you come from a liberal perspective, your paradigm is life is about maximizing pleasure and minimizing pain. But from a religious perspective, you're taught life is not about maximizing pleasure. Life is not about minimizing pain. Life is a struggle. Life is a pain. And we have people like, you know, Schopenhauer who, you know, he recognized that life is essentially suffering. And our fellow human beings are my su my suffering and companion. And one of the uh, one of the aspects of the Western world, which is very different to what it was in the past, and where Islam, I believe, could be a solution to many of the problems that we have here in the West in terms of existential problems, is that Islam is there to explain to you that behind suffering, behind pain, behind these things, there is actually a meaning, and there's something far greater to look forward to. And I believe Christianity, um, because it's lost its influence, and uh, for two reasons. One is obviously the rise of secularism, but two also because I feel um, a lot of the uh, Christians, uh, in terms of clergy and, and pastors and whatnot, they didn't hold on to their strong values. Instead, what they did is they started pandering to liberalism yeah, and they yeah. watered it down and down and down. Yeah, sure. I think it's, you know, there's an aspect here of. Um Victimization, victim yeah. culture, and the step, step in, back in coach, the cod, um, coddling young minds, yeah. and so on. And now, you know, you see this a lot in schools now, the, the fear of competitive sports. Yeah. The idea of yeah. sports days being something where everyone can win. Everyone gets a medal. It's like, it's not necessarily there. I mean, it's okay to be a loser if you turn up and you try hard. And, you know, you can become a good sportsman anyway. You don't have to be the world's quickest runner or anything. Forget that. It's always the guys that come first at anything, the girls that come first at anything. They're always cherished and all of the limelight's thrown on those, those people. But I think generally just being a, a competitor, being turning up, working, being strong, having your grit. body, yeah. being strong, it's great. And being a good, having a good mind, if you're that way in crime, writing books, creative output, do something, be lazy. Yeah. You do get very lazy. You know, you know the, the Protestant work ethic of turning 
to just making looking around you, finding out what you can do, um, conquering your your own self, your own fears, looking at the world and adapting the world to the needs of humans, yeah. the needs of animals. Yeah. It's all good, you know. For sure, like, I think we are. I, I think maybe there's an aspect of the godless. Yeah. In the West, that's we've we've lost sight of that, and now we're mums and dads don't really know. Well, to, to the, the aspiration maybe has been lessened and taken down yeah. a few notches and we're like, well, okay, well, we can do anything we like, we can be anything we want to be and maybe it's good to say, no, let's humble ourselves a little bit. Yeah. We are finite little creatures. Yeah. We can aspire to great things. And yeah. And yeah. you know what's interesting? One of, the, one of the things you touched upon is conquering yourself. As in conquering your bad aspect or the di having discipline essentially. But the way that um, because of the consumer society we live in, we're told to give in to impulses. Just do it. And it's all about you as an individual. It's not about the collective anymore. You know? I've had addictions in my life right? and they've taken a lot of the happiness that I have and the happiness I would have had into the future away from me because I did indulge and I've eaten too much, just smoke a lot, drinking too much. Is this when you, uh, you were godless at the time? Yeah, I mean certainly, yeah, I guess so. Or maybe not even not thinking about that kind of thing, just living like in a agnostic, in a just completely. Yeah, well, just I've been having uh, some a, a problems with epilepsy in my past, right? And mental, some mental health problems, so there actually have been there for a very long time. And I have a scar on my brain that really affected my cognition and my behavior when I was younger. And I used to deaden. Uh, the feelings I, I have and dead in my brain and you know lots of addiction is off, so often it's a way to just dull yourself yeah, yeah, in yeah. the moment yeah, yeah. you don't want to think how can I actually sort these problems out but you know you, you mentioned the medical history there but a lot of people don't have that medical history with the same pattern of behaviour why do you think that is? As you say, it's, it's hedonism, I think. Yeah, yeah. It's indulging in those lower drives, those impulses that, you know, the... the Base desires. Inclining us towards impulsive behaviour, towards sex, towards violence. This is good in the short term. You're not thinking about time horizons, you know. It's like, now, 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 let's have this on sex addiction. Yeah. But put me in a position now where I have a difficulty. Um, I think it's. I don't want to. I really would love to get married, and have kids. Really, really do. And I'm, I'm, I'm of, the, of the mindset now that that's what I want to do with my future. But I've, um, yeah, I've actually chiseled away at my, my heart. I think a few times just been having those that, those passions yeah. that are of a lower nature take over. Yeah. And it wasn't lost. Yeah. It's, not, it's not good and it's quick and it's fun. I think when you're youthful, you've got that youthful exuberance and stuff, and you can you can take that and kind of run run with it so for a bit, but after a while it catches up with yeah. you and it's going to hurt you. Yeah. And literally millions of youngsters are going through this right now. Yeah, and my, my, I come from a, a liberal family who were right. religious. Really. Right. My dad's uh, was a hippie. Right. Uh, he's kind of Taoist. He does believe in a, a divinity to existence now. I think he was never. He never really impressed that. I mean, no like, discipline. Or... There was discipline, but it was also a sense of life. I swear. And it was different from my brother. Me, I was all like, over. Was like, reckless. I was. I had to trouble with school. And, so I, and there was a point where they just kind of gave up a bit. Yeah. Um, my brother was not like me. I didn't go to university. I had a bad, I mean, I'm sorry, a bad school life. I had a good childhood. Mum and dad were never violent, you know that. But there was this liberal tendency just to not have those, those uh, limits. Limits, you know, that's it. Um, you know, the thing about limits is limits are usually demonized. You've got to be free, don't have limits, you know, this kind of thing. But it leads to the lifestyle that you spoke about, which is years and years of going down this uh, bad behavior. 
which then catches up with you later. One of the interesting things about Islam is Islam teaches you uh, there may be things that you hate but they're good for you and things that you love which are bad for you. So in this society, the, it's the other way around. It's whatever you like doing, whatever you love doing, do it. Whatever you hate doing, don't do it. When it's actually too simplistic to think like that because a lot of the times the things which are bad for us are actually things we love. Yeah. So you gotta have, you know, limits are not necessarily a bad thing, you know, and you gotta, um, you gotta sort of unbrainwash yourself from the liberal paradigm. Because the liberal paradigm, it goes all the way to your DNA, essentially. It's the way that it, it makes you think about it. As well, when you're a youngster, you can get access to a mobile phone, and you're a young boy, and there's porn out there. Yeah. Whatever else, it's going to have an effect on your brain young and it will, it's going to meet it out into your adulthood. And you're, if you're affected young, it has an implication for when you're absolutely out, you on, your, I mean? on your cognitive development. I did want to say, like, my mom and dad, I've got to respect, like, I, I love them very much. And they did, and I like, I'm only now beginning to listen to the, the things that they always said. I think I was a special case. Um, they were they're very good people. Um, but there wasn't, I think they, you know, I, you know, I remember only, there were two times my mum hit me. Right. And once, and it, and it was in, I was in 22, 23 at the time, right? But it got me, and I was like, oh shit, I've done something so terrible. And it never happened before, and I think, it's, I'm, not, I'm not advocating violence, yeah. right? Uh, but, it was powerful, you know, and I never got that when I was younger, and I think, I don't know, um, uh, it's difficult, isn't it? I think I listened to my father when we had those conversations and stuff, when you listen to someone who, who you respect, like your dad, and it's important coming from someone like your father, you know what I mean? And I can get that so often, sometimes. Yeah. And it's important, you're, you're a father, you know, when, when you, you have that conversations with your son, you're going to listen to their father more than so many other people. Yeah. But there's also the fact that your father knows more than you and has more life experience. Now, greater than your father is God. Because the thing is, these things that we're speaking about, to really escape from them, you need a worldview. And the worldview that you need, it has to transcend human limits. Because look, if it's up to human beings, human beings would want to do what they want, lead to the most maximum dopamine spikes, right? and destroy themselves essentially. I mean, you spoke about um, young children having access to phones and living a certain uh, type of lifestyle. It destroys your development, but later on, as you grow up in life, you actually start to realize that none of these things make you happy. And true happiness actually comes through your relationship with God. So you, I think in my last conversation with you, you came around to believing in God later, didn't you? Later on in life. Yeah, yeah, so I had a few revelations actually. Very revelations, strong, okay. Of, 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 of the nature of certain things, I think. And they were okay. so profound, and they took me out of my body. And I, and you know, you, sometimes you'll hear of people who compare notes on the kinds of strong religious experiences they've had. Yeah. Maybe there was some aspect of the epilepsy I've had. And sometimes some things. And because of the frail nature of your mind, if you're having a seizure or whatever, some things kind of tend to pop through you know, But yeah, I, I had a, uh, I was given a perception of something that was so strong, so powerful, and that there was a, an existence there, and a conscious, loving power that was certainly transcendental, wasn't coming from my own mind. And, and a, yeah, a few instances in life where things began to happen, synchronicities, and it profoundly changed me. And do you think there's something inside you that was driving you towards God? Yeah, and maybe that that um, that sense of fear that I was doing wrong, wrong doing bad things, and that I was here for a different reason, okay. and I wasn't attaining my or trying to attain the, the, the greatness that perhaps I was capable of attaining. Okay. And it shook me. Okay. And did you then start looking into religion? Yeah, I'd always been into studying religion. I'd okay. always been like interested. I was a bit like I 
debate faith a lot when I was younger, going to forums. I was actually very atheistic when I was in my teens. Okay. Uh, Jesus doesn't exist and stuff like okay. that. Okay. Actually, I believe that still. But you, oh, you, you I, doubt he existed? I, I doubt he existed. I do believe that Christ, consciousness, and Logos, the idea of the Greek Logos, which is then put into John. Right. And he said, you know, Logos, the God, the Word, became flesh right. well, among us. There's something there, it's a very powerful thing. I don't think Jesus became a human being, no. And I think that John heard. Uh, the epistle writers probably, well, they don't appear to know anything of, of the Gospels and the stories of Jesus in the Gospels. They do talk about the Revelation and are getting their Christ from Scripture. Paul says, Revelation is Scripture, that's where I've got my Christ from. Anyway, that's so, would you describe yourself as a Christian? Yeah. Well, okay. I'm one of those esoteric Christians. I'm one, of the, um, one of the what, sorry, Christians? The, the esoteric, more. Um, you know, uh, like Gnosticism? Yeah. Right. Gnostic Christian. Very true. Okay. Um, and it, that gels nicely when you begin to consider that the, uh, the, there's a big meta parable running through Mark. Right. And that Jesus, who doesn't appear to be historical at all, there's no contemporary evidence for Jesus Christ. I understand Muslims don't, don't believe yeah, this. Yeah. Time, right? um, more than that, there's actually the few references you get to Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. Josephus and so on, and Suetonius, Tacitus, they're actually all quite dodgy references. Mm -hmm. And in some respects... You're very different as a Christian then compared to... Yeah. yeah. No, so it is another thing, right? I'm, uh, I was always a contrarian. I would never take anyone's word for anything. Right. That's why I fought with parents for so long. It's like, no, I'm going to go and find out for myself. Right. Thank you very much. And it was idiotic. The simple things were always taught me and I would never miss it. So, you know, when it comes to you looking into Christianity, could it be that you looked into Christianity after you started believing in God because it was the first religion or the religion yeah, of your ancestors? Yeah, yeah. But did you look into Islam? No, yes, and not so much. Okay. If you know what I mean. Um, I think Christianity has its, its a foundation there and a history that I do find very interesting. And the pagan aspects of a lot of the Christian mythology. When you get to the Gospels, you hear, you hear a lot about the dying and rising, that mythos, the virgin birth right. mythos, the certain healing miracles where she actually pays and so on. And you can see where the mythology has crept in to the Greco Roman world. Right. You know? I think it's there. Uh, it's interesting because a lot of Christians won't. Um, a lot, a lot of Christians, uh, they wouldn't agree with you on that. I know. So you, you seem to be quite open-minded. Sure. I want to know. I think there is a there's, there's, it's possible to know quite a lot about Christianity now today. Right. Lots of the well, the Christian world was very closed for quite a long while. There is new scholarship, and, and it's possible to cite very good scholarship today that that actually helps us frame the world that Christianity came from. Right. The books that we use to create Christianity. Uh, the the reference classes. It's, it's really interesting. And it helps us understand that the revelatory power of that ineffable mystery that is God and maybe God within the Christ within like our uh, having his experiences. I mean, are you aware of the differences in theology between Islam and Christianity? I mean, look, the main point of contention, it's not to do with, say, the word Yahweh or, or these types. The main contention is actually to do with the fact that we believe Jesus could not have been God or the Son of God. So Allah uh, is a word that even Arab Christians use. Um, the, supreme, the idea of there being a supreme creator, what the Jewish people believe in, Muslims believe in, the early Christians also believed in that. They didn't believe Jesus was divine being in the beginning. Um, so, you know, in, because obviously you came from an atheistic background, you looked into religion, you should look into Islam because what you find is, we spoke about earlier about suffering, the Islamic perspective on suffering is different to that of Christianity. It's not exactly the same and the theology is different as well. 
And because you're open-minded, you should look into these things because you can't um, stop your journey at the first religion that you research. Yeah, sure, sure. I think that well, the way esoteric, a lot of esoteric Christians look at things, and there's a lot of Gnosticism. There are all kinds of Gnostic sects that came around the first and second centuries. Yeah. Many of them have nothing to do with whatsoever, and lots of them had crazy ideas. Um, the, what they were considered we heretics consider, for most of Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Know, right? yeah. Um, this thing of the Logos, the word, the, the power of the spoken word from the one, the, the all creator, our one, um, that is different, that is a part of that creator, but different, but it, that is it's spoken from the creator in the form of the Logos. Wouldn't you say that's the interpretation of the Bible? No, I think it's, and it's almost relatable, I think, and people can relate to this because they will have a sense sometimes of the divine in their lives, or that special power you get in really understanding how to zero in on it from now and in meditative practices and so on. That, that word is our relationship to the divine. You cannot know God. You, know, you, you would never really... The able true to essence. Yeah. Yeah, sure. But there are... There's uh, the, the notion that... You know, that there are lots of um, words say St. Paul uses and the epistle writers use to express Jesus that sound extremely celestial for one, but also tell us that there's a connection between the inside, the Christ within, and the, the indwelling spirit. But, no, but you know, so let's let's break it down from a foundational point of view. Would you say Jesus is part of God or created by God? Our definition of the logos, the, the vibration, uh, the pneumatic the vibration of the Lord in us through love. I think can be felt and understood. And that was, you know, the idea of everything around us, the whole universe being created by, by Christ, is actually in a lot of these older documents. No, but wouldn't, wouldn't you say um, that God created Jesus because yeah. Jesus is a, is a man? Jesus is a, is, is a homo sapien. Yeah. You know, he's like us. Sure. You know, the idea of God's um, image, sorry, God's image on, on earth. The, the, Ah, there's there are lots of maybe we can come back to that. Like, are, are, are you aware are you are you aware of what the Muslim perspective on the Bible is? I, I know that you, you venerate a lot of the patriarchs. No, um, we, we venerate the prophets, but we don't accept the Bible to be the word of God.